We're on, we're on. Yeah, like anything, I've just not... Um, I've not put my homework in at all. So if anybody isn't watching this and they're just listening, um, Connor, who is on Team SBL... I love you, Connor, by the way, if you're listening. Isn't Connor yeah. great? Do you know that, great. Co- yes. Dude, Connor has... He's like edited videos and created trailers for Reebok, which and they oh, look really? phenomenal. No. Have I shown you them? Yeah. I think I have. I've... I don't. I don't actually know that I've seen them. Um, but I would love to. I, I just know that uh, like Connor had some feedback for me, and we were working on a thing together. And when and like I edited something in iMovie, you know, and <laughs> like and then he was trying to figure out how to kind of like you know like deal with it because I'd done it in iMovie, and then after that, I found out that Connor was a big deal, and I felt like such a goon, man. I yeah. was like, oh no, man, and here I am, like, well, I can send you the iMovie file. <laughs> Awful. Well, he was, uh, Connor was like, I was basically ruining his life. Every time we did a podcast, he was like, dude, the audio is so bad. The mic's so bad. So I, he, he sent me a message. I think it was last week, the week before. And he was like, hint, hint. And it was a link to all of this stuff on Amazon. So here it is. I've got the mic. I've got the, the arm or what the boom arm, but in true Scott yeah, style, man. I plugged it in. I've read zero instructions. I plugged it in. <laughs> 20 seconds before i called you i was like oh i plugged it in and then when you your face turned up on the uh the podcast software yeah. i was like hello that's the first time i'd even saw <laughs> i was like is it gonna well, work it worked it worked dude well hopefully yeah, connor works. i do apologize if anything is wrong um it is totally my fault <laughs> because i didn't do any homework at all and basically yeah just turned up and and pressed go but yeah isn't connor great in fact let's give sharon some love as well sharon's amazing oh, dude oh. sharon's amazing and, and and you know it's funny like so whenever someone sees uh anything that i have done with sbl as a friend of mine you know maybe that is posted up on um instagram or it's on youtube or whatever they're like wow man like those videos look so great and all the editing and i'm like no 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 hold on hold on <laughs> and i really <laughs> try to give credit where credit is due in terms of the editing stuff i mean there are some videos that i do a little bit of that but most of the like the big stuff um that i think you do uh, and I do, right? We send off to this editing team, Sharon, Connor. Yeah, who else? Sha- Sharon. Who else is in that team? Oh, man. Well, Sharon, just shout out as well because she's an amazing bass player and an amazing <laughs> vocalist yes. as well. Oh, yes. she's so good. Uh, we actually stole Sharon. I think, well, she obviously went to Berkeley, didn't she? And mm-hmm. uh, I can't remember how we got in contact with Sharon. I think maybe she. We were advertising for a job or something like that. But when I saw she was a bass player and a killing vocalist as well, I was like, oh, we've got to have her. And she's obviously an amazing editor. Um, But there's Sharon, there's Connor, um, Alan. So Alan does, obviously he wrangles wrangles me. He makes sure that I'm turning up and he's always, he does all of the stuff with me at my end. So like all of the YouTube stuff and all of the courses, Alan does that. And then there's Gav. And Gav, is, he Gav. sits there. Oh. He, Gav sits there with sort of like a project that's three months long and has to figure out how to make it come in on time. Wow. And also, like I don't know if you ever saw. Did you see the fretboard accelerator? Like the yeah, it, the graphics on that are just insane. It's insane. Is that Gav? He, that's Gav, it, and he worked mm. on that I think for six months full time. Oh my god! On, on that. Like full time, on just doing the thing. graphics for that one course. Yeah, and Gav just, is an OG, right? I mean, Gav's yeah. been around a long, long, long time. I mean, oh, I really? remember seeing yeah. stuff when it it seemed to me that it was just you and Gav for for a moment. Was that true? I mean, I remember there was DMAC too, or D is it? Is it am I saying that correctly? D-Mac, yeah, DMAC. Yeah. yeah, Denmark was awesome. So DMAC was like he was before Gav. So DMAC was yeah doing video stuff before Gav. Then gav came on board yeah um before that so before that there was a few others there was a few others so anita has been around for a long time you know anita so she's community manager over in the uh inside sbl the membership um and then travis has been around a long time like years travis has been around maybe I i think that maybe travis has been around slightly less than anita or one like but they've both been around i'll tell you what they've both been around too long that i can't remember Uh, or so long i can't remember um and then but the og the og is actually laura laura has been around oh man for like 
It's got to be like a decade or something like that. Yeah. Oh, like man. Laura. So Laura handles all of the customer support and a bunch of other things. Uh, so she organizes all the merchandise. She did all of the merchandise. I know. And all of that. Yeah. She's, she's I have, awesome. At, at, there's going to be a time that I will get to have like a, a chat with Laura. And I need to apologize to her because when I came on board, the first thing I did, it was like, I came on board and now, you know, okay. And I'm on, you know, almost full time. And now I'm a part of it. I'm part of the Slack community. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm ready to, I'm ready to really dive in and really address. And I remember it was right as merch was coming down and I was like, Oh, merch. Oh, fun. I, I should talk to Laura about all these ideas I have. And I <laughs> sent her this huge list. And you know, sometimes like when you've done something that you feel uh, embarrassed about later, like the, sometimes this still haunts me. So I need to talk to Laura because I remember <laughs> I sent her this huge list of like all these ideas I had, man, because I just wanted to seem valuable. Mm -hmm. Right. And she was like, she, she was, she was nice, but she was also like, what is, what is this? Where is this coming from? And I'm like, oh, these are just cool ideas from the new guy. <laughs> you know, and she was like, oh, great ideas, guy. I got it. <laughs> just like, I still, it's that thing of like, stay in your lane, Allison. Like, oh man, it's sometimes, tough, you know. It's isn't I'll, it, man? Like team oh, stuff yeah. is hard. Like I am just yeah. not, like I can remember just like thinking back to when I started SBO, well, not when I started SBO, but just especially sort of like started hiring team and stuff like that to yeah. help build this thing. I just didn't have a clue. If I could, <laughs> when I just think back, I'm just like, oh <laughs> my word. Because right. actually we're really similar in terms of the idea thing. We're sort of like idea machines and we kind of spew yeah. ideas all of the time. It's just like part <laughs> right. of who we are, it's part of our personality. And I didn't realize that that actually causes headaches for people I, I like i really sure. had no clue and i actually for went sure. to we've got a really fantastic um coach who we work with um called legit and i flew to i was out in la meeting with legit so nate and i so nate's obviously a um, big part of the marketing team and him yep. him and i flew out to um to la and i can remember him sitting down and i can't remember how it came up in the conversation but he obviously sensed that i i had no idea of really um well i think that he had a great idea of who i was as a person and and definitely identified that oh he's an idea machine that spews ideas all the time and he yeah. was just like oh heads up by the way you can't you, you're kind of sort of like as, as sort of like the leader of the team you can't just spew ideas all the time right? because it causes right. fires and people don't, you have to be really conscious about when you, you know, express an idea and, and how you open, you know what I mean, like how you sort of like sell that to the team. And I was like, my, my, my mind was blown. Even think about it now. I'm sure. Like, Whoa. I just didn't yeah, have like that you at just, all. Yeah, you just think that, oh, more ideas is going to be good. That's what everybody mm. wants, right, is more great ideas. Exactly. But then it's that thing of the structural, like, well, what do you do with the ideas, <laughs> right? Oh. I mean, you know, if if there are these ideas floating around, well, then someone has to do something with them. Yeah, it was very, it was enlightening, I guess, uh, you know, finding out that that, you know, people actually don't want more ideas. And I think that the um, Ajit explained it like this he was like look he said when you know some people love ideas but he said some people see ideas as hey here's more work for you to do key piece on top of what you're already doing so yes, it's like each right. idea you have for somebody else if they're not like really into new ideas because some people are into new ideas right but for other people, they were like, oh, great. Like, I'm doing this thing, and you're just, like, adding more on top of the thing that I'm already yeah. doing. I was like, oh. Overwhelming. Overwhelming, yeah. Overwhelming, yeah. So, but, but, you know, hopefully I'm learning. I feel like I'm learning. I'm more, <laughs> I guess that I'm more, I try to be more um, conscious of, yeah, the idea spew that i live in because it still happens For there's sure. no there's no putting a lid on it it's just constant you know i think that like I lisa and i joke about it all the time she's just sort of like and, and, and here's the kicker as well i'm an idea factory but like the worst in the world actually executing on any of it 
<laughs> right, right. Because I'm I know, like, I know yeah. that feeling. I'm very similar to that. I know that feeling because it feels good and creative to have the idea, right? You're like, yeah. oh, what about this? And then that feels exciting. And just the mere fact that you spewed an idea makes you feel the sort of warm creativity fuzzies. And you're like, well, there. That's like, you know, I record stuff into my phone all the time of like little riff ideas or something. And I've got hundreds of them. And I think, oh, and then it feels like, oh, I've done something. But you really haven't done something. I mean, it's you've strange. maybe planted a seed, but if there's no execution, is, is it problem, maybe yeah. meaningless? Yeah. Yeah. I Well, yeah. I, like, I'm totally on board with you. And I think that what I've experienced through growing the team is that I am, even though sort of like a, we're idea machines and we just constantly spew these ideas, when you start building the team, and specifically when you get guys like Phil, around mm. you then it turns into a danger because so if anybody doesn't know who phil is he is ops director of sbl but he's also an amazing executor so what happens when you get these things together is you get somebody that's spewing ideas and also somebody that's really fantastically fantastic at executing on those ideas now yep. that's wicked but the but the downside is that i have to be also conscious that some of my ideas might be just crap you know, sure, and sure. Uh, yeah, so in my, when I'm just alone, um, you know, sort of like do my own thing, I can have all of these, uh, these ideas and maybe I, I might execute on a few of them, you know, yes. but when you've got somebody sure. like Phil, he's like, okay, is this a plan? I'm like, um, yeah, I think so. And he's like, <laughs> okay, let's go do it. And then suddenly right. I'm like, oh, but it's amazing. So for instance, we're doing this live event. Um, or we're, you know, we're 99.9% .9 doing it next year, oh, right? S I love SBL. that you're talking about this on the podcast. Exactly, right? So we're I doing this it. sort of like, we've, you know, we're thinking New York or LA. Um, we're going to be doing sort of like a two-day live event. And not sort of like disclose too much about it, but it's going to be awesome. Anyway, so yes. it's just sort of like an... It's it's an idea, and like if it was just let down, left down to me, it would be an idea, and then it just kind of, and then maybe it might happen. But when you've got a fill, oh, this yeah. is when like you've got the idea, and then suddenly like you're a week down the line or two weeks down the line, and it's like oh, it's happening, and Phil's, you know, he's looked at the calendar, he's spoken to Nick about it, who's sort of like one of the production managers here, and Nick's like, yep, yeah. and, and basically they've got the idea and they're running with it, and and, and honestly sometimes I'm like, oh shit. I hope that idea was a good one. Right, that, because here we go. I guess go. that's the, exactly, yeah. exactly. But honestly, I'd much rather be on this side of the fence than the, where I was before, where I just used to have the ideas and not ex execute. So it's definitely great having people so, you know, we can have ideas and, and <laughs> then people can get yes. that and then drive that forward. You know, well, it's, it's like it. where Phil, you know, where you're like, oh, we should do a podcast. And Phil was like, awesome. You need six episodes before we start to publish, you know, exactly. like you need somebody yeah. like that in your life. Okay. Let me ask you this then. If you're not a big company and you are struggling with productivity, maybe you're an, maybe, you know, for someone listening to this that isn't running a company and maybe mm. they, but they want to do things and they have ideas, but they don't execute on them. Do you feel like bringing someone into your life, whether it's a friend, a partner, um, a relative that is sort of your accountability buddy, <laughs> you know, like, do you need a role like that? If you are an idea factory, like you and I are, do you need someone to say, okay, cool, but here's, or, or how, how do you address that if you don't have a fill? If you don't have a fill. Oh, I think that if, if, if I knew then what I know now, I would, that's a tough question. <laughs> that's a really, really tough, if you don't have a fill, I guess being self-reflective enough to understand that you are an idea factory, you're a creative and also self-reflective enough to understand that you're actually shit at execution as well. Yes, you know what I mean, like, yes. which is, I think, which is a big problem with lots of musicians super creative I agree. terrible executors totally. hey we should put a band together hey we should do an album hey we should try and get a record deal hey we should and it's just we should all talk. we should there's lots of yeah. gunners yeah i've got a friend called mm -hmm. gary and he's like there's gunners and doers are you a gunner or are you a doer i'm gonna do Ooh. this i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that yeah 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 and he's like i'm a doer this guy mm. owns 600 houses <laughs> 600 wow. he 
and he and and, he, and this is him kicking my ass this, this is yeah. this is like i was like i was speaking to him and he was like oh yeah i'm gonna do this i'm gonna he, he just said just sounds like a gunner to me mate i was like oh, oh gary dude gary with that just fire, sounds like a gunner truth yeah oh wow. yeah he's re- he's a really interesting character he's actually my landlord to the uh to the studio that we've got across town he's the landlord there he's super interesting character just comes from nothing man you know just like wow. comes from nothing like chopped his leg off by accident when he was 14 or something yeah what? so wow. oh yeah he's just yeah he's just got such an interest in driving a he stole a tractor or something and <laughs> crashed the track oh yeah crashed the tractor chopped his you leg off get gary on the podcast man oh we, we <laughs> man he'd just take over the podcast but I was speaking to him about about chopping his leg off, and he said, uh, "He said, you know, I wasn't so bothered about the leg." He said, "When I he said when I came to, he said I looked down, I was like, oh, legs come off." And then he said his first thought was, "Was oh no, my mum's gonna kill me." <laughs> that was his first thought. It was it wasn't like remorse oh, about the leg. It was like, right. oh, I'm gonna be grounded forever. Oh yes, just the pr- yeah. the parental disappointment and shame and the trouble you're going to be in. And oh, absolutely, man. wow. Yeah. But but just well, taking it back lived. to, yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a wild guy, wild guy. But yeah, but he is. A, but he's a great example of a doer. He's sort of mm. like just somebody that executes. So yeah, I guess just being self-reflective enough to understand that you're not great at execution and then trying to build things around it. I'm not sure whether, because it's great if you can work with an executor and they have skin in the game. That's the, yeah. that's the best, you know, yes. when they've got skin in the game, you know, you've both, you know, you're both looking at the vision and, and you're both on board. I, I guess that accountability buddies and stuff like that might help to a certain extent, but definitely um, getting somebody with skin in the game. Is, and what does that mean? Key, what does skin okay. in the game mean? Skin in the game means that they it's important to them. It, they're not just doing you a favor. It's important right. to them and their vision of their future. So, for instance, a great um, example of this is we've all been in bands before, you know, and I'm thinking about specific bands in my past where there's been a great executor in the band. Yes. Yep. You know, maybe not so creative. Maybe sometimes they're not so creative. Uh, one individual, actually, two individuals jump into mind. Mm. Um, they weren't so creative and actually got a little bit of a hard time from the other musicians, maybe because of it. You know, maybe they sure. weren't that amazing, or maybe they were just, you know, whatever, right? My point is that maybe the, the other musicians were just like, oh, they're all always so bothered about this and this the the detail they're all always so bothered by the details they're ah, such a right. stickler for the details it's like you know shit sherlock yeah that because they can <laughs> execute and you cannot exactly. the end right? right so i think that from a musician standpoint if you are really creative i actually looking for people that are great executors is yes. like i've not been in that i'm kind of sort of like speaking to myself now sort of like from 10 years 15 years ago thinking like i just didn't understand i didn't understand that there was a huge difference between somebody that is creative and somebody that can execute really well and hey some people there is these ninjas that can do both there there are like they're they're not as common as the creatives and the um, the executors, but they do exist. But right. in my past, I've definitely, in terms of musicians, I can think of a few great executors who who weren't really appreciated for what they were and kind of just got, you know, people talked, you know, I guess talked ill of them a little in a little um, in a in a kind of way, just being like, oh, you know, the stickles stickles for details, and they're you know they're always sort of like focused on all of this shit that I don't care about. And it's and it's all about the yeah. music. Right. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. 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 And and I have felt that way in my past um, around you know people that are oh, they're you know they're wanting to make flyers and promote the show and I'm like Ugh, we need to just write <laughs> cooler songs and you know like I need to be working on that sound for the bridge and and they're yeah. thinking business plan really more. Um, yeah. Do you know someone in my life that I have come across who seems like a unicorn in that way is Corey Corey Wong. I mean, exactly. Yes. An incredible combo of executor and creative. I was on a session with him once and he was multitasking in a way that I've never seen before. He, he had, he had his phone, 
He had one hand on a phone, one hand on a laptop. He was answering a text. He was editing a photo on his laptop, answering mm. a text on his phone. And then he was also listening to playback and then commenting that we should probably get out there and do verse one again. And mm. it was bizarre because it didn't seem like he was scattered. It seemed like he was in all of those places simultaneously with full energy. And I've never seen anything like it. Um, yeah, my buddy yeah. Steve Gould, you know, you know, Steve, great drummer. Yeah, yeah. He was also on that session and he said, uh, we, we call Corey, Corey Wong high output. <laughs> I mean, all caps, yeah. that dude is high output always. And it was, um, it was pretty cool to see. I, I'm not wired that way. If I'm in something, I have to be in that. And uh, if I'm distracted by something, I am truly distracted. I cannot multitask yeah, in that yeah, way. Yeah. But boy, it was interesting to see him <laughs> just yeah, like holding the they reins the of all of like, those things, you know. They're, they're, they are really, um, they're really individual people in that. Like there's a the whole sort of like, there's a personality test as well. There's like the Colby test and yeah. the- Myers-Briggs. The Myers-Briggs and then the Enneagram or Enneagram. Like yep. there's all mm -hmm. of these personality tests. I think they're wildly interesting actually because yeah because we're all actually even though we all look pretty much the same we've got like mm -hmm. ears and you know two little holes in the <laughs> yes. front of our faces and our yeah. eyes are in there and our nose and our mouth and stuff <laughs> we're actually wired completely differently and we all right. find things you know other some things easy some things hard and, and it, we're just you know a complete you know it's really fantastic actually but yeah so for me I guess that I didn't really answer your question, but it would be look out for these great executors and just make sure that you just appreciate them for who they are. I, in fact, one guy jumps to mind in Leeds and the Leeds, he was a bass player and the Leeds music scene was uh, really bustly at the time, specifically mm. jazz and improvised bass music. He was into jazz and improvised bass music, improvised music. Um, he was a bass player and he ran like, Man, he must have been running, running like five to eight jam sessions all around wow. the city, and Run then he the was scene. all yeah, and then he was all also organizing gigs and stuff like that. And yeah, he was putting himself on the gigs a lot of the time, not all the time, but he was on the gigs, right? Um, and and he got a lot of shit. He got a lot of shit, not directly to his face, but people were just like, oh, he's on the gig or whatever. You know what I mean, and maybe sure. maybe there was something there he could have done a little better you know in terms of sort of like i guess sort of like farming out different gigs and getting more bass players involved and stuff like that but i tell you what he moved away and the scene just went <laughs> like for yes. us for not but not for like six months for like you know two or three years it just went wow. and all of the jam sessions well not all of them but like maybe five of them disappeared and like wow. all of this it's actually the people, these executors, the, the guys that actually hold, they hold everything together and make it happen. Yeah. You know, they make it happen. So yeah. they're so important, so important. So important. Yeah. Yeah. And I was actually talking to Phil today and we were talking about this in, in a different way, but we were just talking about the, I guess the importance of executors and project managers and how really critical they are to any organization and any project is... Oh. Yeah. So, so if somebody's listening to this and they've got a they've got a project that they really want to get off the ground, you know, and you've got a bunch of a bunch of uh, musicians, maybe like four to six musicians, let's say, you know, try and identify who is the natural or the most natural executor amongst you as a as a group of people, and then you know, let them free, let them do their thing, and when they do it, be thankful. <laughs> yes, and treat it like a treat it like it's part of it's as important as the art because it's the thing that's yeah. going to have the project, make the project happen. It's as important. It's like a crew on tour, you know, like if you're doing a tour um, and the, all the stage hands, the LD, um, the tour manager, front of house, all that stuff. I mean, the show wouldn't happen. I mean, I know it goes, it sort of maybe goes without saying that the show wouldn't happen without those people, but sometimes um, the treatment of those people by the band or, you know, they're, they're just not as seen or they're not, uh, maybe don't feel as valued. And oh my God, man. I mean, I remember being on a tour, we got to be out with Kelly Clarkson and just seeing the crew, they would load in at 8 a.m. every day and build the video yeah, wall. And yeah, you know, yeah. you go see a show and those big, beautiful video walls, those are, 
those are constructed piece by piece. Every piece of it lives that, in its that's, own road That's the case. hardest gig, isn't it? Dude, <laughs> Dude. The, you know, the guys that build those stages every single day, that's the Unreal. hardest gig. Oh, it's unreal. But I mean, the people that like to do that really do genuinely like to do it. You know, I mean, they're, yeah. they're excited to build that thing and, and problem solve in this new space, but yeah, they also want to not be, um, taken for granted, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Just, yeah. Abs yeah. I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. I was just thinking about two other, a great example of this is Aaron and Nate on the team. Like, so yeah. Aaron's a really fantastic executor and has, can see all of the moving parts all at the same time where Nate mm. is like a mad scientist, you know, he's got this sort of like, sure. and they work really well together. And that's, you know, that's why they work really well together. Side note is that, yeah. so Aaron and Nate um, run the marketing over at SBL, if anybody's listening. Um, but side note is that, Ian, are you still there? Cause your video has just gone off, but I think you should. Oh yeah. Fine. Yeah. No, I am. Oh, it's I'm fine. Here. Yeah. 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 Yep. So I was speaking to Aaron earlier and and he he's he he said he was going on holiday. So I'm like, oh, wicked man, where are you going? He's like, oh, I'm going on a survival week. I was like, what? And I was like, what? where are you going, dude? To the Ukraine. I was like, what? <laughs> he's going on a survival week to the Ukraine, what? and it's like Whoa. some kind of buds training. Like his wow. buds, sort of like really hardcore marine I, like i've got no idea but it sounded awful and he, he called it holiday i was like I'm not, dude i'm not sure that this is a holiday i was like so fascinated like kind oh, of part wild. of me is yeah like have you ever done anything like that no no i i am uh i am a i enjoy the comforts of the great indoors scott oh man i think i'm up for it dude i, th li li I think as soon as you think i am i think i am but i think i might be it might be the end of me in terms of so like, I might realize that I'm just sort of like Dude, you useless. Might love it, though. Dude, no way, no way. You know what? That farm background, that divine farm boy background, is going to kick back in. You're going to remember all the problems you had to solve as a kid on the I'd be farm. Like shearing the sheep. <laughs> Dude, you would crush it. You would crush it. I know. Because you told me, too, in an early episode, like, oh, your idea, like Lisa, your wife's idea of a holiday is to, you know, be inside, maybe watch some movies, you know, just chill out, you know, relax. And you're like, nope, you know, like pulling up break, your pants I'll to go wade in the yeah. river. <laughs> I break yeah. them basically, yeah. I mean, like the the last holiday that we went on was the worst. Actually, I just broke the kids. I was like up at sort oh. of like you know seven o'clock. I was like, come on, let's go, 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 go. And like we're out the door oh. and then doing the thing. And then we're because we're on holiday, we're they're late to bed, so the kids aren't sleeping enough, and they were just broken by yep. the end. Of, they were broken, <laughs> but it was great fun. It only took them like you know oh, a few yeah. months to months to recover. Ah, but I'm really excited <laughs> seeing Aaron's. I'm hoping he's got some stories about this survival training. Oh, I can't um, wait. Yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait. Anyway, I can't dude, wait to see it. Yeah. are we going to talk about you posted this thing to me earlier? Was it well, groove? I hit you with a bunch of ideas, dude. I Speaking love the of groove, like, you know, ideas. Groove versus chops. I'm like, oh, dude. we can do this and this and this and this. Yeah, yeah. What about groove versus chops, man? Yeah, sure. Like, I really do think chops. it's. Yeah. Like, and I, I wrote down some notes earlier. And honestly, I, I found it a little difficult to to kind of, I guess, sort of find an in, find the in to this conversation, the groove mm. versus chops, because I think that we, like, let's define, I guess, what they are first of all, and, wh and why sure. there is a, why there should be a conversation around groove versus chops. Well, can I tell you um, what just inspired me to even just write that down? Oh, yeah. And then I would love yeah. to define it, is yeah. there's, uh, have you seen Zach Grooves on YouTube, drummer? Yes. American kid, drummer. Killing it. Like, killing it. And he does this stuff where he'll go on Omegle and will play um, groove. Like, he'll just play like a beat, right, and groove yeah. it. And then he'll play crazy over the kit for people and ask the people what they like more. Yeah. And it's just fascinating what, what people say. And some people are really motivated by the flash and other people are like feeling the beat. And, you know, and of course, there's never like a necessarily like a definitive answer and that's a silly mm. thing to do but it, it got me thinking about my trajectory in this whole thing anyway and i'm sure you have thoughts about it too so yeah um and i i mean yeah i would love i would love to talk about it i do think it warrants discussion and um and for sure we can define it yeah man i mean i feel like we could take a whole episode defining it but I, i'd love to know what you think 
It's a real deep subject, isn't it? It's a real, yes. real deep, deep subject. The first, well, first of all, when you put Groove versus Chop, the first thing that came to mind, I was like, are they linked? Like, mm. does one, does one need the other? Does does, does mm-hmm. Chops need Groove, and does Groove need Chops? I'm not sure. I think that obviously they're both underpinned by technique, right? I think they're sure. both underpinned by technique, and I think that's something I've like I've spoken to students about it before, is that your groove can actually be affected by technique and specifically or, or lack like, thereof, right? Or yeah. lack thereof, right? And, and yeah. a, a great example that I like to use is that I am a, you know, a wannabe drummer, right? I'm sort of like, I love playing drums badly. Dude, me too. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yes. right? And But my time sucks, right? It, like, mm. it, it, it compared with bass, it sucks. Even that yes, statement sure. doesn't yes. make sense, right? Because we all know that groove is actually internal. We feel it internally, you know, when you click your fingers. Yep. You know, all of that stuff. It's really yep. internal. Yep. So so because of that, well, well, what gives then? Why, why is my time bad on drums and why is it not bad on bass? Well, it's because my technique is, it just sucks on drums and it's kind of sloppy and just gets in the way. Right. So it, so it is linked to groove in a way, but then at some point, like where does chops come into it? I don't know. What's your take on it? Oh man. Well, I, I, first of all, I totally agree with you that they're linked because it's such a good point. I have a drum set too. Uh, and I love to just sit down and try to play like quiet pocket. I just try to play like, boom, a boom, like, you know, and real, like just a rim shot kind of just really soft, but, but I'm, I suck at it also because exactly right. Your brain, you haven't done it enough. You haven't built the muscle memory. You don't have the technique. You're still wondering how to get a nice sound out of the kick drum. I mean, how to play the hi-hat and not make it sound really like stiff and stupid. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just about your brain doesn't know how to tell your limbs how to do it. Even though you can pat on your chest and pat on your legs and feel like you're the greatest. Or like air drum to Neil Peart fills <laughs> and feel like I'm, you know, you're the greatest the drummer best. alive. I'm doing I'm the best. I'm the best, yes. man. <laughs> yeah. And then you get behind a kit and there's all these other dynamics at play, of course. Yeah. So I, I love that idea that technique is linked. Um, I mean, boy, I will say for me, I went through a thing where when I started to play the bass, I got really into technique. I got really into learning different skills and really trying to, you know, be able to slap, be able to play with a pick, be able to tap. I got into mm. all this progressive rock. I mean, I've mentioned this before. And so for me, chops was also impressive and I didn't have an identity. I think... I think if I could link the importance of chops to something, I think it is about more, it's more about youthful identity creation. (laughs) Like I think when people are really, really invested in showing in playing fast and playing um, pyrotechnically, especially when you're young, it's about, I perceive it this way anyway, as there's a chip on the shoulder and you are, you want to say, you want to make a statement and say, look how good I am. Check it out. Now, of course, there are people that have built their careers on that and are, you know, Mm. not adolescent kids anymore and are still doing that thing and are incredible and inspire us all. But at least I will say for me, when I went into a music store and played something fast, that's when people would notice me right? I was terrible at sports. I was terrible at everything, but I could go on the bass and somebody would say, whoa, what is that? And that, and now I'm, now I'm suddenly I'm noticed. And I think that is pretty infectious as a kid, especially when like, okay, and now, you know, you're playing in bands and you're writing things that do that. And you think, oh, well, I'm good. And then maybe some of the fundamental aspects of your playing. Can you walk a blues? <laughs> Can you play a really super solid sounding eighth note figure uh, over, a, over a pop tune? Maybe those things are sort of, they're not prioritized and then maybe it takes a while for you to learn how to do that. At least that's how it happened for me. It was about making people believe <laughs> that mm. I was good, right? Um, and I think that there's pros and cons to that, but in the beginning, that was a real driver. I think that's why when you go into guitar center or wherever it is, you hear 
kids going little, 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 shredding because they're trying to get noticed. They're just for God's sake, notice me. I'm here. I'm doing something. You know, like, pay attention yeah, 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 to me. Yeah. I've been practicing <laughs> you know? this for weeks. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and I think that um, that gets that gets uh, shit on a lot by people like, oh, you know, you go into the music store and everybody just you know wanking and but. I do think it's actually a really important part of the process yeah, uh, is yeah. to go through that. Um, I don't know, man. Does that bring anything up for you? Yeah. 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 Like it does. I can totally see how, why that happens. I, in terms of like me, could, like reflecting on, cause I was, I am, um, did resonate with the chops thing. Yes. Um, but I, but I did it in a different way, actually. I, I did it for me. It was more about, I guess, like what I was, what I was drawn to as a listener, mm. if that makes sense. So for yes, me, it was, I just loved that as a listener. I can remember listening to these guys and I'm not afraid to, sh to, to say it. I'd be listening to, or you know, I'd be listening to whoever, right? Jameson or Babbitt or whatever the, the, those tracks just didn't do it for me back in the day. They right. just didn't. Yep. I really liked a um, a specific style of playing that was uh, that had a a, a very specific um, feel to it um, from a technique standpoint. And it wasn't just yeah. flash. Actually, I wasn't. I've never really been into like slap actually interesting because that's sort of like one that is definitely sort of like a part of chops for me it was more sure. about fast fast finger style playing but it was yes. more driven to it was driven by just loving it as a listener and just thinking oh that sounds bonkers i gotta be able to do that i need to be able to yeah. do that so that's it what inspired really drew you to want to play right it ins inspired me yeah i was just like oh i just need to go do that that's amazing yeah. so for me it was much more driven by that um, but sure, like I'd still get the chops out in the bass shop, right? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> because I've been playing it for weeks and I wanted somebody to be like, yeah. damn, he can play. <laughs> and dude, you said something just now that I really think, I, I think would actually be a big um, sigh of relief for maybe for some players. Like you have educators like yourself and like me who are talking about, well, oh, Jamerson, right? And the Beatles and all the classics. And we're really paying homage to all these things. Like you, I'm actually really happy to hear you say that because like you, I perceived Motown music when I was young, teenager, I perceived Motown music, Beatles, Led Zeppelin, all of the classics as old, old guy music. Old. Like it, old, Where's dude. The, yeah, the bass, man. What's yes. wrong with that bass? It sounds like, yeah, it, it sounds, sounds like an old dude singing in the and shower. Flappy and <laughs> dude, that is so funny because it took me, I mean, it took me so long to understand. I mean, and I've told the story on the podcast before about getting fired, you know, for my first session because mm, yeah. I didn't know that material and it took me a long time to learn how to appreciate it. But yes, I would go to Dairy Queen, which is like an ice cream shop in the States. And there, some of them were like, uh, old time themed. So there'd be like a fifties or sixties theme and they would play Motown music. And it just sounded yeah. like, it sounded hilarious. And I would hear the Beatles as a kid and it sounded like a carnival. It sounded <laughs> funny. It didn't yeah, sound yeah. cool. It sounded didn't sound silly. like Pearl Jam. <laughs> <laughs> Damn right, dude. Damn right. <laughs> and, and it took me a long time to understand, oh, 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 no, these classics are part of what is going to make a career. But, you know, you have to have this stuff under yeah, your belt. Yeah. But in the beginning, yeah, I was very inspired, too, by a certain kind of playing. I mean, maybe not necessarily the same stuff as you, but although I definitely went through a big Gary Willis phase with Tribal Tech and... There was for sure some like fusion jazz music that I really liked, but I went down the progressive rock zone. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I was yeah. into Dream Theater and Rush and Yes and Crimson and Dude, and I was so, listening to Under know, a Glass Moon with my kids the other day. I was like, Oh Dude, God, it's so good. This is Under the Glass Moon. <laughs> Check out the guitar solo. They were both like, Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so good. I mean, it, oh yeah. That was I was fifteen when I heard that record. It's so great. But yes, I mean 
so, so here's something. If you're listening to this podcast and you are one of those people that, that maybe felt shame about not knowing the entire, you know, McCartney catalog growing up, or maybe you still don't, it's okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. It's Absolutely, okay. Yeah. It's just important. The thing that I talk to people about now and see, see what you think of this is I say, even if you don't like it, it's not really about that. It's about understanding where these particular genres, band styles fit into the larger narrative framework of music. And even yeah. if you're not compelled to learn all of, um, you know, uh, John Paul Jones lines with Led Zeppelin, understanding that it's really important for the trajectory of rock and roll uh, is... Yeah. Yeah, is is very, very important. And then I even think it kind of lets you off the hook. So now you don't have to say, well, I'm a Stones guy or I'm a Beatles guy or I'm a... You can say, oh, I I prefer listening to something else, but I to I've, I've devoured the Queen catalog. <laughs> you know, I've devoured yeah. Miles Davis. I understand where they are positioned. And I've taken the things that I love from it and incorporated those things into my playing versus like, oh, yeah, man, I grew up. Dude, anybody that's like, oh, yeah, I grew up loving Motown and James Jamerson. No one even knew who James Jamerson was. It like any, yeah. when, when anybody says that to me, like, oh yeah, man, I grew up just loving Jamerson. I think you are a liar. <laughs> <laughs> liar, man. <laughs> no way. Nobody knew who he was. It's, it's true, knew. one, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I think an interesting point to make, and I mean, like, I really think that this is true. It's, it's, it's the truth. Like if anybody's like, no, 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 just, yeah. this, this is the truth, right? Oh, I'm ready. I can't wait for that divine truth. Groove or great time feel can exist without chops. Oh, but chops of course. cannot exist without great groove or time feel. Dude, like I just, love that. It just can't, you know. So it just cannot. So you're saying... And there's a lot of people out there with uh, who who spend a lot of time working on their chops, on the the, the cool techniques. I'm yep. taking nothing away from that. I did that too. It's awesome, yep. right? Me too. Yep. But, and I'm speaking to myself for you as well, because I, yeah. were, I was like chops first when I was a kid. It was all about the chops. I learned the hard way that groove has to, groove and great time feel has to exist. On, yes. You know, but it, I mean, groove and great time feel um, like must exist, but in certain, and chops doesn't, but you can't have chops existing without the great groove and the great time feel, because that's when so. the wheels come off. <laughs> Of course. And I 100% agree with you. And I think then that actually helps us to define chops. So chops just isn't playing a series of notes really fast out of context in a vacuum, right? Yeah. Chops have to exist going has to exist in some kind of grid or on exactly. some kind of yeah. Yeah. <laughs> timeline for them to yeah. be. So, so what happens if someone is just working on something out of time? Um, they're just trying to get a technique together. It's not grooving. Uh, and they're really just focused on the technique. You're saying that in order for those chops to find root or to find meaning, they have to be connected to time feel. They have to be. Well, yeah. Well, two things, actually. They have to be connected to time feel. So when you... When you listen to great chops, you play, or, or players with great chops, they, the lines that they're playing exist within the grid, and and yes. they, and the more that they groove and the time feels locked in, the better they're going to sound. Which is why, yes. you know, there's a bunch of players like Victor Wooten jumps to mind, Billy Sheehan oh. jumps to yes. mind. Um, I'm trying to think of. Pat Metheny because for me even, jumps to mind actually because his oh, time course. feel when he's soloing is just absolutely phenomenal and he's just got so chops cool. to die for. I will yeah. say that there's a few drummers that I've seen um, online uh, that actually like, you know, famous famous drummers that have got like chops, but I, I, I hmm, <laughs> when it comes when to time feel. When they maybe settle into something, yeah. Yeah, when they settle into something, I'm like, Mm, not too keen on that time feel for me but sure. so that's the first thing so like definitely to have those chops they need to you know you can have the technical ability to um to execute the lines but when you execute them they need to fit and sit r correctly within the grid but also yes. that you can be a great groove player with no chops 
and the world's still going to be great. But if you That's flip so it, true. you can be a great chopsy player or you can have you can be able to execute that stuff, you know. But if you haven't got the groove, you're in serious trouble. <laughs> you're dead meat. And you then dead what meat. I've seen too with some of those players, what I've seen is this this uh maybe entitlement or this um indig uh indignation i don't know is that a word around like hold on i'm so good i can play so fast why am i not getting called why am i not on that gig why am i not playing with this artist i'm crushing it i've put so many hours into going you know and (laughs) what's happening you know and and i i think that's so true people really do want um to play with musicians typically that first of all, first and foremost, are going to make the music feel really good. Yeah. Like I have a, a a great example in my life is there's a my dear friend Grady Kenevin lives in Minneapolis. He builds uh, drums for this company called Franklin Drums, and he is a wonderful drummer. In addition to being like an incredible craftsman and building these instruments, yeah. and he gets called. He has no interest in chops. He just really likes songs. He can sing any song. He knows all the bands. He he was been listening to music ever since he was super tiny and his mom was really into it. And so he came up a big music fan and he is always listening to the vocal because it's how he grew up. He's just like singing songs. So his drumming is never, he never thinks drums first. He's always listening to the song and reacting. He's never thinking, ooh, I just put this new head on my 10-inch tom. It's going to sound, ooh, I just bought this new ride. I can't wait to get onto that bell and see how it, you know. He's thinking, oh, the vocal is doing this, so I need to be doing this. And for that reason, his time feel is also killing because he's thinking about song. He's not trying a fill that is not going to land ever. Yeah. And for that reason, he gets asked to do all kinds of things. He's in the Got studio. It. He's And other people are going, boy, there are other, you know, drummers that are trying to be studio drummers in town that are going, wait, why is Grady getting this call? Like, I'm practicing all the time and I'm working on my chops. Why is this guy who maybe doesn't practice the drums all the time? And it's because he prioritizes the song. And yeah, boy, oh boy, yeah. that is a big, big deal. It's a big deal. It's huge, yeah. It's huge. I was thinking as, as well while you were talking about when you said that he had great groove, time, feel, and pocket, which oh, for me, the, these are all kind of like the same thing. It's yeah. not really about having metronomic time. When I say good time, because it, it's a little elastic, isn't it? Or the elastic's not the right... Well, in terms of time, it's you can be elastic. But I mean, sort yeah. of like in terms of terminology, you know, people say groove, people say time, feel, great time, great pocket. For me, it's kind of all the same thing, you know. Yes, I agree. It's, you know, it's, you, know you, you can keep time. That's a given, actually. I'm, I'm not really talking about playing in time. I guess it's, it's important just to say, I'm not really talking about not speeding up and not slowing down. <laughs> That's a given, sure. you know, that's, that's like, tempo. okay, that's tempo. We all need to play, yeah. you know, at the given speed. And, and it is a little elastic. We can speed it. We can slow down. That's just, it is a thing. But what we're talking when it comes to groove, time, feel, and pocket is just that thing of making it feel amazing. And yeah. interestingly, you know, Chops, You'll have had this experience, right? Chops, mm. you know, when you see somebody playing the chops and like, you know, and ooh, it's 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 whoa. But yeah. when you when you're an experienced musician and you hear somebody playing with great time feel, it is mm. as standout as anybody playing any chops. It's like yes. oh, it just stands it's, out. It's, it's like oh, it's deeply satisfying. I think for it me, it's like a, yeah, dude, yeah, it's yeah like a warm it's bug, isn't kind, it? Oh. Yes, it's less of like fireworks. I'm not like wow, but I'm more like oh, like that thing, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like oh, like you just want to lean back and like clutch your chest. It's just yeah. uh, it's fabulous. Yes, yeah. Yeah. I I completely agree, and I think you know. You know, if you take a platform like Instagram, there's a lot of people doing a lot of fancy things on it. And those are the things that maybe get more likes, they get the claps. But I also love when I see a player just playing something very simple and solid and it feels it's just groovy and it's simple and it's not going for, it's not, it's not thirsty. You know, it's not trying for all the likes. (laughs) I I love seeing drummers just go boom. 
you know, and just playing oh, yeah. like there's, super there's a, simple pocket. I'm like, Ooh, there's a great, great drummer based out in, um, I think his name's Paul, based out in, you might know Paul Mayberry. Guy. Yeah, Paul, Paul Mayberry. Mayberry. Yeah, I love his oh, Instagram dude, account. It's just, it's just 100%. him doing that. It's just great. Yeah, yes. It's just great. I, Paul dude, Mayberry. I got to see, I got to see Paul Mayberry do a clinic. He's in the he's in the Christian world. He's in the CCM world, yeah. and um, I got to see him do a clinic at this festival where he talked about doing sessions and talked about uh, why he played the way he played, and it was so interesting. And he talked about one thing that I've never forgotten. Someone asked him about his fills, and he said, "You know, when I grew up, I really loved '80s music, and so I, a lot of that was programmed." And I would hear these drum fills that were like, like they were really choppy and sample Yeah. And they sounded like a drum machine. And he's like, so that's what I just want to sound like that when I play. He said, that's actually my truth. He's like, I'd love to be able to say, oh yeah, it was Weckl or, you know, Cal It was, no, it was actually drum machines. Um, so when he plays and, and now whenever I hear him, I'm like, oh, I hear that. Like when he starts, Ka-ka. like he starts oh, something and it so sounds good. like that. It sounds like a drum machine. He's a master <laughs> of sounds as well. He just gets the sound he right, doesn't he? Yeah. Incredible. Um, he, he's one of my very favorite like session guys out there. He's, he's yeah. unbelievable. And yeah, he's Gould, man. one Gould of those as players. Well. Oh, I think dude, like Gould, oh. dude. And I was thinking about Gould in this thing where, you know, we're talking about time and Gould has a dear friend from high school named Chris Morrissey. And Chris Morrissey's a great bass player who's played with Juliana and he's in, he's in New York. Yeah. And uh, they were having a conversation. Gould told me about this. Um, actually, when we were doing the, uh, the bass and drums course for SBL, oh, right. yeah, yeah, Gould yeah. was saying, yeah, that he and Chris were talking and that Chris said something like, man, the longer I do this the more I find out and realize that rhythm is just the whole game. It's yeah, the whole game. Yeah, yeah. And so shout out to Chris Morrissey, man. If you ever listen to this podcast that I have thought about that quote so often because it's so true. If you have a great melody, you have a great technique, you have a great series of notes. It is nothing without the underpinning of rhythm and groove and like putting it into context rhythmically. I really yeah. do think that's true. Matt, if somebody came to me and said, what's the one thing, if you could rewind time, what's the one thing you would have spent more time working on above anything else? Mm. It would be, it would be groove and time. Like it's yeah. like, it, I, I mean, there would be no hesitate. It would spew out of my mouth in an instant. <laughs> it's just grooving time, <laughs> yeah. grooving yeah. time because everything starts there like everything yes. like technique obviously is like how we hold the instrument how we play the notes from a physical point of view but after that everything is grooving time everything yes. comes back to that so it's the one thing i wish i'd worked on so much more i wish i'd just yeah. played with more drum machines i wish i'd you know experimented with cool metronome exercise and fun stuff like that i wish i'd hooked yeah. up with more drummers and just th said to them let's just groove for 30 minutes on a, on a vibe yeah. i mean on a vibe i wish i just appreciated it more i just wish i'd done mm. more of it like way more of it over a, a way more like extended period of time right because my when yeah. i went nuts practicing for me in the past it was probably between the ages of about sort of like seven, 18 to about, you know, like mid twenties, maybe, maybe less like, no, like yeah, 18 to mid, mid twenties. I kind of sort of went, went bonk, a lot of practice in those sort of like six or seven years. And I wish I'd given, you know, a lot more attention to groove and time because it's so important and there's so much enjoyment in there and also so much enjoyment for other people playing with you when you've oh. just got that. Oh, that'll just lock down. Oh, yes. <laughs> Whenever I talk so to important. students and, and they're and they're struggling with with this stuff or, you know, really struggling to make something feel good. Um, I talk about uh, Dave King, um, who, you know, you know, Dave King, oh, drummer in Minneapolis, so who does good. Rational Funk. And yeah, so good, um, yeah. he has this there's a great bit in Rational Funk where he talks about so many jazz musicians, jazz drummers, when um, they're working on all this independence and all these high-level concepts, but their ride, they're just playing only swing ride sounds terrible. Mm -hmm. And to really 
really work on playing swing ride, period. And then yeah. he says, and if you're into backbeat, um, if you're into backbeat music, which is a, a, essentially like 99% of the music that I play, he said, play backbeat, boom, t bap, t boom, t bap. And he said, and play that simple groove for a half an hour yeah. and yeah. just get into it. Uh, just play it over and over and over because that thing, that backbeat or that swing feel, whichever kind of camp you find that you want to work on, it's everything. It informs everything else. And that was really inspirational to me, actually. So there are times where I'll pick up my bass and I will just try to find one thing. Boom, 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 and try to play it over and over and over again and not and really fight the temptation to play a big fill or to you know do any extra stuff, but just play that one thing. And then the value becomes the way it starts to feel. It starts to feel good. It starts to feel comfortable, right? It starts to feel like, oh, this is this is finally locking up and it feels it feels easy, not easy and like boring, but yeah, oh, that it's yeah. just landing in the right place. And boy, that's a, if you have that in your playing, I mean, I think that's something we should all be working on. But if you have that in your playing and you prioritize that, then when you start a tune, right? If you start um, I Wish by Stevie Wonder, and you have that feel inside of you, the drum, you know, the band is going to look at you and be like, yeah, all right, here we go, you know, and there is exactly. no better feeling. Yeah in the world exactly. than to have a drummer smile at you because you yeah. started the tune off in the right way or you know it's, a, it's exactly an feeling. Uh, there's a fantastic drummer um that lives over in manchester called mikey wilson who mm. has done like a bunch of session stuff um and i was on a gig with mikey and it, the first time i played with him and like he's got a bunch of chops and and i can be setting up his kit i'll always remember this because it was, mm. you know, it's always the first time you experience something, isn't it? That the best. It's just yes, the best. For sure. Yeah. So you can never have it back. <laughs> you can never have it. You can never yeah, have it again. Yeah. So he sets yeah. up his kit and he's, you know, pulling things into into position, stuff like that, and, and then he just sits down. And there's something else going on at the t at the time. Something in the in the venue. So he can't make a lot of noise. He can't sort of like play his kit. So he just plays. It's super quiet, oh, right? Man, yeah, I listened yeah. to it. I was like, it, I'd never experienced that. I was like, this guy, the way he made that feel, just a straight, mm. he made that feel. It was pocket. amazing. Yeah, I was like, yeah. oh, that is insane. <laughs> Where the kick drum yeah. was landing on the grid, I was like, oh, that is insane. Yeah. Anyway, so another great drummer, again from Manchester, uh, a guy called Dave. He, I was speaking to Dave, and um, and I was I was like, oh, you know, talking about Mikey because Dave actually went to Mikey for some lessons, and he was like, you know, the best thing that he told me to do, the thing that had the biggest impact on me. I was like, what is it? I was expecting yeah, this what thing. Is it? What is it? He was like, yeah, get one groove and just sit on it like a meditation for like thirty minutes. Yes, and just yep. play it over. And almost like you're just meditating on that one groove. Yeah. And when he said that, I just, my memory flicked back just to when I was playing with Mikey and I was like, I get it. That's what he's yeah. done. He's just done hours of sitting there playing one groove. And that's why it yeah. felt amazing because the devil's in the detail, right? You know, we can yep. all go to school and we can all learn that, you know, from the drum teacher who comes in, we can learn that simple beat on day one. I could teach it to one of my kids. In fact, both Absolutely. of them can play that, that beat, but the devil's in the detail and making it all like that thing, make it feel amazing. That just comes yeah. with time sent, spent sitting on that groove and playing it and just giving yes. it the attention that it deserves. And the thing that I would add to that too, is if if you've never tried it, like if you're listening to this podcast and you think, oh, I, I wanna try that, really resist this idea that it's going to be boring. Really, instead of that, like instead of in the headspace of, oh, well, that's gonna be so boring. Think about this. I love the word you use, meditation. Um, and you know, and I've talked about practice being self-care. Really think about the time that you spend playing a simple groove that feels good 
as a meditation. It's your Zen time. It's your self-care. It's, it's a vacation. It's time that you just get to be with the instrument and be with you and, and be working on something that is so critically important. It is so much more important than learning how to burn, um, you know, certain, a, a whole tone scale over giant steps. Like yeah. that's, that has its place also, but playing soft, good time, 30 minutes on one groove if you can get into the headspace that that is not only good for you not only like eating your vegetables but actually like a beautiful thing that you can do to take care of yourself um yeah. boy it's it's a game changer it's totally a game changer for me um 100 i yeah. And and then you discover, too, it gets rid of discomfort. Steve Gould has this other thing that he talks about in an upcoming course that we filmed for SBL. It's the, it's the uh, Rhythm Section Volume 2. Oh, yeah. He talks about the enemy of groove is discomfort. So if you're uncomfortable with something, it feels... Ah, it feels stiff or like you can't, maybe it's technique that's in the way, but this thing that you play feels hard and it doesn't feel fun to play. It feels uncomfortable that yeah. that is the enemy of groove. And you have to figure out, is it your technique? Are you trying to play it too quickly? What suss out why it's feeling uncomfortable and then endeavor to make it feel comfortable? Because then when it feels comfortable, guess what? It's going to start grooving. And then it's going to make yeah. everybody happy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And when you and when you're practicing, just some like little tips as well. When you're practicing, mm. sort of like that one groove, just over and over again, you can like play it within different contexts to keep it. Um, just you know, make it fresh and keep it different. So, for instance, if you were doing like I wish, let's take that as an example from yeah. Stevie Wonder. Mm -hmm. right? Yep. What a great riff! Anyway, so, so you're doing that. Get a drum machine on that that has that rhythm. Play, play with the drum machine, right? And just yeah. play and meditate on that groove. Okay. Now, when you're completely worn out and you just sort of like, oh. Okay, now get the metronome on. Can you can you on, on like four yeah. four beats a bar, right? Can you keep yep. that groove? Can you make it groove as hard with that, you know, that metronome on four beats a bar, and then drop that yeah. down onto just two and four after like five yeah. ten minutes? Yep, for sure. Then you got the metronome under two and four, and then after that, drop drop that metronome just down to the four. Ah. Uh. Yeah. Uh, and you're still yeah. playing the thing, right? So what you're doing there Absolutely. is that you're you're taking this one phrase and you are really practicing your pocket and your feel on yes. top of it. Your by just time. Chain, yeah, your internal time by just changing the context. You're doing it with a drum machine, you're doing it with a metronome, or you know, beat on uh, click on every beat, then you're reducing that metronome down, then you're reducing it down again, and you're trying to keep it well, feeling it. as great. And again, some people would say, oh, this is all about, you know, making sure that you're, you know, not speeding up and not slowing down and all of that good stuff. All of that, yes, to a certain, like, that's in there, but but it's more actually about making it, fit, keep, like, making sure that the groove and the feel is coming from you and you're not le mm. leaning on an external source to, to make it feel great, you know. Oh, that's a really to, good. That's a really To your point. point, when you said, you know, when you start that riff, I wish, right? And the rest of the mm -hmm. band hear you and they're like, oh, this is it. It's going to sound great. Yes. That's what we're looking for. We're, we're, looking, we're looking for, for being able to play the line and everybody hearing the line and be like, oh, this is going to feel great. Just like I listened yeah. to Mikey Wilson when he played that simple backbeat groove and I was like, oh, this is going to feel bonkers. You know, we're yes. looking for that. And, and, and just to add to that, I think that one of the, one of the, the, the attractive things about chops and working on that side of your technique versus groove is also mm. that it's easier to measure. And that is just something oh, to throw yeah. out there. It's something to yep. be aware of. It's actually easier to measure technique because you're, you know, because you can do it. You can either do it or you're, or you can't. And you're sort right. of like, whereas like groove and great time feel, we're kind we're of nebulous. talking, it's nebulous. It's really hard to put your finger on it. It's, you know, I might listen to a drummer and think, eh, I'm not really keen on his time feel. Like a bunch of other people might listen to him and just think, dude's killing it. 
love is time right. feels. So it is a little, you know, it is nebulous. It is, you know, it kind of like it's pixels just in a way. But I'll tell you what, it, yeah. it definitely exists. It exists yes. and, and we need to work on it, you know, and I wish I'd worked on it so much more. So all of these things are just, you know. You know, to add on to your, to your great tips too about the metronome stuff, um, something I, I just did a most recent episode of Student Focus where, hey, if you're an SBL member and you're listening to this podcast, Scott and I do this thing called Student Focus where you can submit a video and we give you feedback. And I am still really enjoying that. Like I look forward to doing it every time. There's a crew of people that submit. It's really awesome. Um, there is a, I have been saying more and more to people you know, get, get this in your body, you know, feel this when you're playing and you cross legs and nothing is moving and you're playing along to something in player's path, right? Which is, you know, this awesome thing we have on the platform at SBL. If I'm not seeing you internalize this beat, it's the first thing I'm going to say to everybody. It's the feedback yeah. that I give almost everyone. Yeah. And what I've been talking about too lately is stand up, put the, get a strap on and Put maybe the metronome or, or turn up your, however you do it, if you've got wireless Bluetooth, great, and walk around your flat, your house, the yard, whatever, and play. Walk to the tempo, dance. And I, I told someone recently, imagine that Jamario Artis had to do a different gig and you got hired to do Bruno Mars. Guess yeah, yeah, what? Yeah. You are going to need to dance. Um, or or you're going you're gonna to fill in for Verdine with Earth, Wind, and Fire. Guess what? <laughs> You're not only going to need to be, be playing September really well, you are going to yeah. need to do dance steps. And there is nothing better for your feel than to connect it to your body. If you're grooving, yeah. if you're sitting down and your legs going, your head's going, great. But also standing up, doing it without, uh, even then doing it without a click, you know, putting on, just grabbing your bass and walking around and finding tempo in your feet. And walking around. And <laughs> I mean, you know, maybe embarrassing if your family's around or, or whatever, but boy, it's so critical. Like connecting that pulse to your body, for me anyway, has been like a big, big game changer. Yeah, because you're kind of dancing, right? Like even yeah, with your body, dancing. like you feel the you feel the rhythm you feel through it. through your body, like so much. Yeah, it's 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 really critical. It's critical. Yeah, it's. I'm trying to. I'm I'm racking my mind just to imagine somebody like you know if there's somebody that's amazing that doesn't do that i can't really i <laughs> just can't stands really stands like a stiff yeah and just yeah, plays exactly yeah, yeah. It, it, it's kind I'm of sort of like a telltale there. it's a telltale sign actually um but again because we do the student focus together that a students maybe you know not that experienced when they're when they're stiff you know when they're super right. stiff right. and they're just sort of like they're yep. not moving so yeah it's definitely something to look out for who is there anybody that jumps to mind to you just to bring it back around to chops? Because, you know, yeah. and I just wanted to, I uh, guess, sort of like, just sort of like nail it down for everybody that we are not poo pooing chops at all. No, you know, right. I right. love chops. Sure. I am like all into the chops and I love chopsy players, but I guess what the, we didn't have any, um, we didn't have any, uh, like dark plan here to sort of like to to to, <laughs> no, to, to be like we have to sell groove to everybody. It was just really kind of sort of like, again, just like all of these podcasts are just sort of like self explore like we're, we're exploring this stuff ourselves, and yeah. and hopefully you guys are coming on the journey with us. But um, so chops are awesome as well. But who is there anybody that really jumps out that just has both that you're just like oh. Like that well, guy's just got, oh, that girl has got chops to die for and just amazing uh, time feel as well. Yeah. I think the two people that actually just sprang immediately to mind um, are Michelle and Dege Ocello and Victor Wooten. <gasps> um, those two players to me coming up, like I had a real renaissance when I discovered um, more like groove based music. I think we've talked about even uh, Hubert. Hubert Eves, I think, who played with... Oh, um, Hubert Eves, dude. Yeah, oh. The fourth okay. or the third, or who played with the Erica fourth, Badu. Everybody stop, right? Yeah, Erica Badu, yeah. the live, it's called Baduism <laughs> Live, right? Is that right? Yeah. Baduism Live. I think it's just called if, Erica Badu Live. If you've yeah. not listened to this album, you... And if you... Okay, yeah, let me amazing. put it... If you, if you haven't listened to this album, and then on hearing us talking about that album, you haven't listened to it within the next two days, shame on you. Uh, you are not a lover Shame. of music. 
<laughs> you should put your oh, base down. Man. That's divine throwing down that gauntlet, dude. He's it's, throwing down the gauntlet. Dude, dude. Yeah, it's, it's just... Yeah, you got to listen. You've it's, got it's to great. listen. It's just great. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you know, like, I I just wasn't hip to that music in the beginning, right? I was listening to metal and, you know, I was, I was just trying to be fast and yeah. fancy on the bass. And I loved, you know, natural minor scales. And, um, and then when I got hipped more to like a, a funk ethos, an R&B thing, I mean, obviously Victor Wooten, I remember seeing Victor with Bela Fleck at the zoo, um, it, which is, there's a Minnesota zoo that has a great venue. And I remember thinking, I was blown away by how his whole notes sounded. I remember like really, obviously I'd heard him flash and he's incredible and underpinned by an unbelievable time feeling groove. But then Amazing. when I heard him with Bela just play boom, boo doo doo doo, the way he made simple playing sound was so lovely. And I remember thinking, wow, that doesn't get talked about enough for Victor, at least at the time in my circle of friends. It was like, oh, man, have you heard classical thump and all the double thumbing stuff that he Go does? Ahead. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was like, but boy, I think his his thing is underpinned by such an incredible groove. And so Michelle who yells Victor and Cello, oh, and Michelle, yeah. Oh. Yeah, Michelle, Michelle, big time. Like that first record, Plantation Lullabies, I think that was 92. It It is so funky. And her time feel is still, I listen to that record and it is bonkers and she is playing some heavy like difficult lines so it yeah. is a really cool combination her playing to me has always been this really awesome hybrid of of groove and chops yeah great choices for me i'll do two you? i'm gonna do yeah. two and then i'm gonna do this wild card that's not so chopsy oh, but wait. but just a really fantastic musician um from it from this area went to see this guy play and he just said he had the most incredible time feel and it's not who you expect i, I want to oh, share yeah. it because i think it's worth sharing oh, I can't. yeah awesome um so the first of me is richard bonner i think that oh yeah yes. his time feel the way the the placement of, of the note of like i've got it's he's an alien like you know i've got nothing else to say on it it's just like yeah. so great he's um he's got that whole sort of like cameroonian thing going on which and, and they yeah. you know i also like etienne etienne mbappe i'm hopefully pronouncing his name <laughs> okay um he's got a, that <laughs> similar know. vibe i know yeah he's got a same you know a similar kind of feel it's just like a it's just a feel thing and and also chops to die for obviously both of them yeah. have got chops to die for um, now, I'm not familiar with the second one, with uh, the second name you said. Etienne is who actually, he, he, he wears gloves. He's a French, he wears, actually, I think he lives in Paris, but he wears gloves. Mm. And he's the, <laughs> he's the guy who, who I got yeah. the idea for the glove, who saved, oh, cool. my, saved my music career. How weird oh, is that? Incredible. So, yeah, so um, I was going to a specialist down in London for focal dystonia, which is the thing that I've got, right? Yeah. So I was going to Catherine and and she was um telling me all of this stuff all of these exercises to use none of which were working unfortunately yeah and and she you know on the side she just kind of like made this remark of like one of her violin students who was also suffering from focal dystonia was wearing latex gloves to play because it gave wow. gave them the ab ability to keep on playing i was like latex gloves i'm never gonna live that down people are gonna think i'm a murderer or something yeah you know especially right, right. my friends they'll be like okay who are you gonna kill today divine <laughs> but anyway but i thought ah oh, but etienne he wears these sort of like skin tight black gloves. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, maybe that'll work. And it yeah. was actually, so, you know, kind of inadvertently kind of like knowing that Etienne was wearing these gloves led me to kind of chase that down. And it really worked for me. So it was That's like, amazing. yeah. Yeah. It was, That's it was, so cool. Yeah. There's another player actually who I kind of really want to give a shout out to right now. Who's got great. Let me, not many people talk about this guy online as well so i'm actually going to take the time just to uh oh yeah because please. many of you please won't do. have um oh what's the oh you know when you want to oh damn it it was on the tip of oh, it was on the tip all... of your brain i could tell oh got it got it got it got it got it got it yeah it's actually there's a really fantastic player called lucy clifford oh but uh, yeah, she's from Sydney. I think she lives yeah. out in New York. But she was playing one of his lines the other day. Yes, Michelle Alibo. 
Michelle mm. Alibo. Definitely, like, if you've not checked him out, this guy is just, I, oh. I need to check brutal, him out. Yeah. Brutal time feel. Again, sort of like when I li listen to Michelle Alibo, there's there's sort of like an element of that Richard Bonner, Etienne Mbappe, mm. that kind of time feel. Isn't that so interesting that you can, I can group these guys together in time feel. I'm like, yeah. these guys remind me of each other. This yep. Weird, right? But anyway, so. It's so cool. It's so cool, isn't it? That yeah, their time yeah. feel reminds me of each other. So there's Richard Bonner and the other guys <laughs> that <I> snuck in <laughs> yep. there as well. Yep, yep. Um, and then on the other side, John Patatucci. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, Dude, his time feel Patatucci. is just bonkers. And it's yes. something when everybody thinks about John Patatucci, they, they think about... Um, they think about the chops, you know, or right. the improvisational right. ability that he has, because he has just got this ridiculous improvisational toolkit that he just can unleash at any second. For sure. But his time feel, so two things. So his time feel, when I heard, like, we're about to release a course. Um, we've got a bunch of courses from John Patatucci, actually, oh, but one's coming, wait. yeah, one's coming next week of him. I can't wait. It's like, I think the title of it is... Uh, John Patatucci technique concepts, and it, it's him breaking his breaking down his own personal approach to technique and how he thinks about it. So that's cool. coming on SBL next week, I think. Oh, actually, yeah. no, this will be actually it will already be out. We'll have it's out. It's out. Go get it. Ho hope you've been enjoying it. Yeah, yeah hope you've been enjoying it. If you've not checked <laughs> yes. it out, go check it out. But yeah. his time feel is so. He did some stuff on that course. I was watching. I was just like, oh, he's just time feel is so great. He, side note: he's he's using a Yamaha, um, a Yamaha base that's unavailable. I'm not mm. sure why it's unavailable. It's it's like it's not his signature, but it's a five string. Like, oh. if anybody from Yamaha is listening, you should just make it as, like, a second John Patatucci signature because it sounds so great. I think oh, it's got cool. a P-Bass pickup on it. It just sounds oh, amazing. I, I feel like I've seen that. Because yeah. didn't he do... He didn't... Oh, how it's have got, I seen He's a that? black bass with yes, a... Yes, with of a like P-Pickup in it. P-Pickup, it's... Yep. He's got flats on it. It sounds incredible. And his time oh, cool. feel is just... It's so good. Oh, it's add so good base to the uh, list divine add yeah yeah list. absolutely and i've spoken <laughs> to john a lot about i guess sort of like his philosophy around playing um obviously he, with him coming on board sbl we've spoken a, a bunch over zoom he is just obsessed with time feel it's just yeah. like it's, it's the just thing he, it's the thing it's the yeah. thing yeah and yeah and he's got chops to die for but you know gro like groove and time feels the thing yeah patatucci yeah well let me but, ask you this oh sorry sorry go ahead yeah this guy i wanted to tell you about so, yeah please um the guy i wanted to tell you about is that uh, a really fantastic uh bass player called Richard Hammond. Not There is a bass, a bass oh. player out there called Richard Hammond. It's not that Richard Hammond. It's another okay, okay. Richard Hammond. Okay. He is a fantastic bass player from Leeds. Um, and he went to a... So, and he's like a, a massive, like, Richard Bona nerd. Yes. Etienne yep. Mbappe. Yes. Like, he's like a nerd with those guys. Jacko nerd. Like, and yeah. he's just such a brutal player as well. So good. Anyway, so he goes to this gig. And, and we were talking about, and he's actually a huge fan of this guy. So he goes to the gig, watches the gig, and I see him the week after. And he, I was like, how's the gig, dude? And he's like, man. He's like, the gig was great. But honestly, the most astounding thing about it was this guy's time feel. He said, mm. I've, he said it was so great. He said it just up there. He said with, those guys, with all of those guys, he said that his time feel was amazing. It was wow. Paul McCartney. Oh. <laughs> it was Paul McCartney. Oh, I it. Love was a it. Paul McCartney gig. Yeah. He just said that his time feel was amazing. He mm. said it was the one thing he kind of he came away stunned by his time feel. He said he was right. just like, oh. He said he just wasn't expecting it. He said, yeah, great songs. Yeah. Sure. I mean, like his Classic vocals, lines. amazing. I mean, yeah. what a great front man, singer, all that. He said his time feel was so good man i need to see him i need to see him before it's too late yeah oh, and he's banned Paul obviously McCartney. you know he's banned you know yeah oh of course um uh uh shoot i'm blanking on his drummer's name laboriel jr isn't yeah, it laboriel jr, jr. Hey, yeah oh yeah. dude i mean that guy grew so hard i have i have a friend who you know i was never into paul mccartney post beatles i never got into wings and then i had a great friend who uh you know, it was like, oh man, no, 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 you got to check it out. You got to check out his current band and really hipped me to that. And I mean, unbelievable. Yeah. 
Oh, that's so cool. good. Yeah. I wonder with Paul, I wonder if he just, I wonder like how he developed for somebody like Paul McCartney. He's probably, let's get it straight. I mean, like, oh, Mac is not sitting down and, uh, you know, sticking on his metronome and, uh, you know, sort of like <laughs> rin- right. rinsing yeah. the exercises, right? <laughs> you know, yeah. Paul, yeah. oh, Macca. Like, oh, but, so how, yeah. how, where does somebody like that develop his time for? Like, I've thought about that. And, and my guess is just sort of like years of playing with amazing, mu- like world-class musicians. Yes, yeah, for just sure. Just world-class musicians just doing it. Just, ev- you know, just like, you know, tour upon tour upon tour, upon yes. year upon year of just sort of like world-class musicians. You just end up with the great feel as a byproduct, right? Okay, dudes. If it looks weird, if you're watching the podcast, you might be thinking, whoa, Ian and Scott just did a quick costume change. We had a, yeah, woo, spooky. We just had a, a, (laughs) my internet just went down and then we couldn't get it back up. And then I was just like, okay, we'll do it another day. So we're just, we're going to wrap up the, uh, this podcast, Um, but we're going to do it. But Ian has got a question. And as the as the pod as yeah. the recording died, Ian was just like, "Oh, I've got a question. I really want to hit you up with." So we'll record it <laughs> when we do the outro of the podcast. So this is the outro, Ian. Over to you. <laughs> this is the outro. I mean, okay. So as the best I can recall, we were in the midst of of really expounding on the virtues of groove, mm-hmm. and Chops was probably feeling a little bit a little bit beat up in the corner. Um, and of course, I, f- I feel like too in the podcast, we maybe said, oh, it's not the chops are useless, right? It's, but so my question to you is, do you think that everyone needs to have a period of chops? Well, I have two questions. Do you think that everyone needs to go through a period of chops to kind of come back and say, oh, this isn't the main focus and that groove actually is but you have to go through that chops period similarly do you find that chops are necessary to execute on certain things that may be required of you in your trajectory in anything in a band in the studio right do you find that a chops component is necessary for execution and also for coming back around and discovering that groove is really the thing. Yeah, but yes to both of those. So <laughs> I'll, I'll go in reverse order. So number two, yeah, for sure. Yes. And I don't, I don't know why it popped into my mind when you were asking that, but I was like, yeah, Sir Duke, right? That mm. bass run out of Sir Duke to really nail yeah. that. Um, obviously, for anybody listening to Stevie Wonder track, boom, you know, um, what a great track. It's the best. But that is actually. It's not that easy to play and especially not easy to play no. in the pocket, you know, because there is that it's chopsy. It's like a huge kind of like run that lasts four or eight bars or whatever. Um, but to do it and yeah. not lose the time, not lose the pocket is that's the key part, isn't it? There's a, a gazillion bass players who can play that line, but can which bass players can play the line up to te- tempo and when you listen to it you can feel that deep pocket behind it and that's the key thing so yeah i think that you absolutely do need to have an element of chops no matter what your what style of music you're playing or what you're kind of aiming to do as a bass player but sure. number one question number one is it required that you kind of like go over i mean you like you go to the dark side Yes, yes. <laughs> um, that, that's just top of mind because Get into the job. Yeah, we've just been like we're having massive Star Wars sessions over here. You would be proud of me, man. You'd be proud of me. This you have. Oh, we've just been going so deep into Star Wars over the last few weeks. It's been. Oh, just, I love yeah, it. Yeah, like oh, I love it. And Winter's been with us. Winter, man, she's six. I'm like. We're watching, you know, we're yeah. watching like these things are like twelve plus. I'm like looking at, I'm looking at winter. I'm like, is are you cool? I'm like, are you cool? She's like, daddy, <laughs> right, daddy. She's. Like, I'm like, but this emperor guy is just having his face fried, and he looks like a roasted chicken, and she's just like howling. Yeah, like, I'm just like this stuff would have terrified me <laughs> when I was a kid. This would have terrified me. My two kids are just like soaking. Right. They just think it's hilarious. Anyhow, but uh, oh. yeah, but in terms of, you know what? I think you do. I think you maybe you do need to. You know, everybody needs to kind of experiment with that side. I think that your, 
I think there's there's so much to be gained by doing it, and and I think that everybody should just put them out so I, I, just, I mean, even if they're just sort of like you know, I'm a, just an out and out groove player. It's all I want to do, and just you know, dip your toe yeah. in that water because I think there's something to be something to be experienced and something to be learned, and I think that it will tighten your it will tighten your technique up. You to be able to play the chop, chopsy stuff. You need to tighten your technique up, and that is only going to pay off in the long right. run. You know, you're only going to nobody That's wants so yeah nobody wants crappy technique. So <clears throat> if you're having to uh, really tighten your technique up and figure that stuff out, yeah, maybe you decide that you don't want to do that in the future or whatever. Yeah, like l- l- and then you can sort of like dial it back or whatever. And when you were asking that question, I was thinking, I wonder if Tim LaFave, because like Tim's not like an like a, a out and out mm. chopsy player i wonder if tim ever sat there and was like mm-hmm. nerding out over jazz solos or chopsy stuff and trying to get it down my guess that he, i guess he would i'm just gonna i'm just gonna i, I will ask I think him so too. i will ask him when we speak but yeah. yeah yeah what about you yeah i don't i don't know that well um i the reason i ask is because i had this experience when i uh, i taught at this little um private uh college in minneapolis for about 10 years and it was really after I had done the big pendulum swing. Okay, so I'd been in, in a rock band and I'd been really interested in playing, you know, difficult things. Mm. I was a prog rock guy. And then, you know, I discovered Erica Badu and I discovered Pino and I, I really swung the other direction um, in terms of like, okay, I just need to, I need to be thinking about pocket. I need to be thinking about groove. That's when I entered the teaching zone. And instead of you know, really digging into difficult things with so many students. I was like, none of that stuff matters. I really was like pendulum over here. I was like, okay, you just, you need to lay it down. Let's like, let's walk a blues. Let's lay in the pocket, same groove, 30 minutes, that kind of thing. And in some of the players, what I discovered is two things. There was some, sometimes a fire wasn't lit because there wasn't a big, big challenge. Like, you know, if you're learning the Sir Duke line, yeah. That's this sort of goal. There's goalposts. And so if you're just going boom, boom, that may not be, you know, yeah. that might not be the thing to light the fire. And then the second thing is I discovered there were some players that got really like comfortable sitting in a groove and then there would be something asked of them, like the Sir Duke thing or maybe playing a head in a jazz tune. And they were like, oh, but but Ian said, you know, Professor Allison said that, I would never need this stuff. Go ahead, go and ahead. suddenly, oh, you need it, right? And so I found that I sort of did a disservice by by really swinging the pendulum hard over to groove and saying like, oh, if you're grooving, you're all good forever. It's not, I, I have found that the facility and like what you said, the technique that you gain as focused on chops can come in then really handy. Mm. Yeah, I agree with all of that. I was just th- think about some great players as well that are kind of more groove orientated. Like you mentioned Pino Palladino there. Like Pino Palladino's got chops. Like he's got chops. Um, he does. He does. Yeah. You are right. Yeah. There's some great. There's like this great. Um, there's a few great solos actually that Pino t- takes that are on YouTube. But one of them is playing with the guitar Dominic Miller from the from Sting's band. Um, it's like mm. a tr- it's a trio yes. Dominic Miller. Um, it's got Manu Kachu on drums and it's got Pino on this five string music man stingray and he's solo and it sounds great. And he's got chops. He's got chops. Like listen to what he did with John Mayer. I mean, like some of the stuff that he did with John Mayer on that that live trio album was just way, I can remember just like like working out this like massive pentatonic. Like I was like, what is this? It was like. So yeah, dude's got chops. Like, what other? Who other like Big time. peeps jumped to? Who 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 jumps to mind as sort of like a groove bass player that we can? I mean, that doesn't have chops. No, that, that like, doesn't necessarily. Yeah, I mean, maybe just they like, all do. Like Michelle, Michelle. Yeah, uh, she has chops. Um, oh, she's got chops. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, I know. Now that my feet are to the fire, I don't know that I'm going to be able to pull anybody up. It just is like fine to just sit there and then has no. Like you've never seen the next gear. Yeah, I, I think that is something that's really compelling about like a player where like they're they're grooving, 
you know, you're like, oh, I wonder, I wonder if that's it. And then there's all these chops under the hood. It's like yeah. a, it's like a, a car that you're, that has all this horsepower, but you're fine to drive at, you know, at 20 or 30 miles per hour. And then when you need it, oh, you know, they've you can step on the gas. Extra, that's a pretty fun yeah. feeling to see. They've got, yeah. a, they've got an extra mm -hmm. gear, haven't they? Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know who's <laughs> a groove player with no chops. Does it exist? I'm sure it does. I mean, how about this? What about Family Man? You know, like mm. some of the, the reggae players mm. sitting sitting in this wide pocket. I've never heard a Marley track where there's been some super flashy, fast Yeah, that's thing. true, actually, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, can't, I can't think of anybody. like He might have chops. but He might have chops. I yeah. think that, yeah. So if anybody's like listening, just, just get in the shed, start chopping out, dudes. <laughs> <laughs> but like even jameson it's all, I think, it's all valid yeah think about jameson like jameson oh, had some killer right. chops that some of his lines were just so right. bonkers to try and play i love that breakdown you did on there what was it i want you back it was such a great lesson oh, that you yeah. did on youtube oh, thanks, oh i loved yeah. it i just really enjoyed there's so little there's all these little intricacies that he's doing and just and you nailed him in that lesson actually. Yes. So if anybody's not watched that lesson, oh, go cheers. check it out. What's what's the title of that YouTube lesson? Uh that that was it wasn't Jamerson, because that's oh, yeah. that is the legendary tune, right? That that everybody thinks is Jamerson, but is oh, actually, and the I great have actually Wilson Felder. I, 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 yeah. And I knew <laughs> check it out. I knew and I'm in my mind, I'm like, oh yeah, that Jamerson bass line. And I actually knew that. I wonder how that happens. I know. I know. Yeah, there you go. Do you know what? Just <laughs> it's just it, go on. the Motown thing, so synonymous. It is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Just to wrap this up, man, I also yeah. In because we spoke about this album, the Erica Badu live album, earlier on in this episode, which for us yeah. was like a week ago, right? That's right. We spoke about it, and that um, it inspired me to go and listen to that album again, dude. Oh, yeah, yeah, dude, yeah, dude, dude. It's, Does it still hold up to you? Do you still love it? It did more than hold up. It just yes. ripped my face off. I was like, "What the uh, living yes. daylights is this?" Oh, it's just man. That album, is, I can't think of any album that comes even close to it in terms of just playing, like, parts. Like, that, the bass player, Hubert Eves IV, he uses, mm -hmm. he's, it's almost, it's a complete different, he's not, he, like, he's playing bass, obviously, but... The way that he goes about it in that album is yeah. just not, it's not like a normal bass. It's just like, he's not grooving like normal. It's like a part. It's almost like he's playing these yeah. sort of like keys parts. Like it's written. Yeah, like it's written. I know. And, but he, he does it in such an amazing way. And the this how he uses space is outrageous. Yes. It's outrageous. Yes. I don't think I've ever heard anybody. And it, it's because it's in a trio setting. So you can, well, it's like a trio. The band's a trio exactly. and they've got the BVs, right? And it's just so open, isn't yep. it? And he just just like leaves acres of of space. I know. And then just, oh. Uh, and it'll just like hit this like low, like low D or low C or something on the B string. Yes, and it's just incredible. I know. And the way that Poojie Bell and he play together is just uh, it's so outrageous yes. i can't even put it into words i'm just it blew me away i for i know for a full yeah, for a full yeah. two or three days all i looked at is mtds <laughs> i was like i just went <laughs> I on like, this I gotta, like i gotta get one of those oh, man. I was just like, oh it's so so good just outrageous i've got nothing else to say just uh, everybody it made yeah. me wonder i know man it made me wonder if we ever need to play with a guitar player again. You know what I mean? Just that that sound of that trio in like Rhodes or Whirly or whatever. Is it maybe Rhodes? And then, uh, you know, drums and bass. And then, yeah, it's like parts and space. And there's this bravery in that rhythm section to go a boom, clap, to clap, a boom. It's exactly You know, that. just leave these, like you said, yeah. these acres, just these huge holes. And then you hear, you hear all the detail. You hear the reverb in the room from the rim shot. And you hear every little inflection that Eric is singing, right? I mean, it just, it's like, 
it's really a master class on like rhythm section. It really playing. is. It really is. It's not like he's got a chord chart yeah. in front of him and he's and he's worked these things. Like it's like, yeah, it's like a G major going to an E minor. It's <laughs> it's like yeah, the no. bass. It it's it's the bass line is a part of the song and the melody, but without it being a riff. Yes. That's really uh, something so weird to yes. say that because right? like all bass parts right for the most part you're like yeah well yeah he plays a riff and that's why it's part of the song so like you know i want right. i want you back it's a riff um what yes. what's that bow town like all of these you yes, know, yes all of uh, these riff based um yes these songs i was made to love yeah i was made to love her yeah. and all of that right but he didn't do yeah. any of that like he isn't playing any riffs but the bass line is integral to the song. It's integral. It's like, yes. a, it's as important. So I think that might be the unique thing. There's definitely something special about that album. Oh, what's it called? Oh, what's it I called? Let, it's amazing. Let me just check. It's just called Live. It's called Erica Badu Live, I believe. I'm gonna, I'm gonna check it now for everybody. Oh, Eric. Yeah, check it. And this is before the bass player after. Um, after Hubert Eves was, um, oh, what was his name? He was great as well. I don't know. Oh. Yeah, she's had, she plays with heavy, heavy people for sure. That's the first time I, I saw Thundercat actually. Was, uh, oh, with her? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Where is this live album? Oh, there it is. It's called Erica Badu. Where are we? Oh, these ads on YouTube <laughs> says the man that <laughs> says the man that runs a million ads on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Dude, Hello. yes. Oh, it's oh. great. Oh yeah. Oh dude. It's also just mixed so beautifully. I know. Dude. What? On earth? I know. I know, it's so sick. <laughs> and he just leans like slightly backside too, right? Yeah. It's so great. I'm sorry if anybody's thinking the audio is crap. I'm just playing this out on my Mac and just, you know, you just have to catch it. But <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. let me just get to... Um... It's this bit coming up, it's just... Oh, watch. That low C thing. I know, dude. Low C. Listen, this, the fact that you love this record so much is one of the many reasons why you and I are so compatible, dude. I'm telling you. Like, I love that you feel that. <laughs> I am the speechless. Best. The feel is just yes. insane. I'm like, I know. If I, oh, it's insane. did you see it live? Did you go and see them live? No, no, no. I never did. I mean, I was, I became aware of her after, sort of like after this period, you know, feel like this had come out. Maybe she was still touring in that configuration, but no, I never got a chance. Did you, have you seen her? No, I have, but not with that band, but just, like, I don't think I, I, yeah. I would have like internally combusted if I'd seen that. I would have just been on the floor. I know, just, like, just, uh, I know. It's, oh. And where, where is Scott Devine? Where is Hubert Eves the fourth? Man, I was looking into him we online. Need, we, need to, we need to get Hubert on, don't we? Where? There's a great, yeah, so there's a great, um, Hubert, let me just have a look on here. Hubert Eves, I love that he's called the fourth. I wish I was Scott Divine the fourth or third or something. There's, yeah, there's a, well, you could just put it on there. And I'm going to put it on there. I'm, people would just believe there's a great in, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's a great interview called, if you want to search it on YouTube, it's called GBC Hubert Eves the fourth, the new cool. And he, um, it's an mm. interview with this lovely guy called George Farmer, bass player, who interviews him. He talks a lot about that that album, 
and and that you know that whole mm-hmm. thing and then he's actually released um a solo um i'm trying to find it here is that it yeah he's released this solo um track where he's where hubert's singing on it he plays the bass on it he plays the drums on it cool um i think he does the keys on it like the full thing and um and i went and checked nice. yeah i went and checked it out oh dude 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 beastly dude i gotta check that out i need to i need to dig back in Dude. And the horn, the horn lines, dude. Hubert. And dude, he plays this bass solo on it. It's killing. Oh. Dude plays a bass I'm solo. Sure. He gets the chops out, dude. <laughs> Hubert went to the yeah, chop shop. Okay, okay. He went so, to the chop shop. <laughs> so, so. Long way round saying that, yes, indeed, even the, the guys that just write are, are these like space monsters with a perfect pocket, you know that they've got something under the hood, man, that uh, you thought it was a five speed, surprise, sixth gear, dude's, you know. Dude, hey, like, dude's got how many chops ooh. as well? Dude's got how many chops? So I'm listening yeah, to it within really? the first like four mm. bars, there's this like beautiful minor chord. And Hubert whips out the major seven. Seriously, he plays this sort of like oh, he plays like a major seven, major minor seven he plays situation over, over like a C minor. I'm not sure it's C minor, but over a C minor, he plays like an E flat augmented triad. I'm like, oh, in the solo. Wow. Yeah. Oh. oh, that's cool. Hubert, we love you. Oh man, I got I got to check it out. Hubert, we love you, yeah. man. We love you. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Let's call it, dude. Let's call it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> dude, thanks so much for listening and putting up with our base ridiculousness. Um, we will be back with you very soon. Obviously, leave a review for the podcast. We'll send you all of our base love and uh, we will catch you on the next episode. You got anything to leave them with, Ian? Oh, man. Just uh, dig into that pocket, but also don't be afraid of the chops. Don't be afraid of the chops. Absolutely. And go listen to the Erica Badu album. Erica Badu live album. Yes. Um, oh, just buckle up. So good. Bye, right, dudes. We'll see you later. Take it easy. <laughs> Bye. Cheers, everybody. Cheers.